Welcome to the 285th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome Indiana University Medical School professor Gabriel Boslett for a discussion of a pulmonary specialist's life in the pandemic. As a reminder, you can usually catch COVID Calls live on weekdays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, May 31st, 2021, there are 3,542,587 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. The United States is reporting 594,431 deaths from COVID-19. State of Indiana is reporting 13,620 deaths from COVID-19. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline is Michael Bennett, small town doctor who pushed for masks, dies at 52. This appeared in the New York Times, Those We've Lost section, it was written by Richard Sandemir and published March 26th of this year. The past 15 years, there were only two family physicians in Greenfield, Missouri, a town with 1,371 residents, about 40 miles northwest of Springfield. One of them was Dr. Michael Bennett, who opened his practice, the Greenfield Medical Center, in 2005. He was a vigorous proponent of wearing masks and of social distancing during the coronavirus pandemic, offered free COVID-19 testing to his patients with funding help from the Federal CARES Act, but also faced resistance, sometimes fierce, to his calls from some townspeople. He got death threats from the community, some from business owners and some from Texas, his brother Damon said in an interview. He faced bullying wherever he went. He added, he knew he faced serious risk from treating patients who refused to wear masks. Despite the precautions that Dr. Bennett took in treating infected patients, he nevertheless tested positive for the coronavirus in late December of 2020. He was soon hospitalized in St. Louis and spent 50 days connected to a ventilator and an ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation unit, a machine that acts as an artificial lung. He died of COVID-19 on March 6th, his former wife, Teresa Bennett, said. He was 52. Since the start of the pandemic, Dade County, Missouri, where Greenfield is situated, has recorded 723 positive tests and 31 deaths, most of the fatalities nursing home residents, according to Pamela Kramer, the administrator of the county health department. It's really hit us, but not as hard as other areas, she said. Nationwide, at the time that this obituary was published, 463,205 healthcare workers have tested positive for the coronavirus and 1,541 have died. That's as of April 13th, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Michael Keith Bennett was born on February 15th, 1969 in New London, Missouri, in the Northeast part of the state. His father, Bob, was a farmer. His mother, Meredith Arnold Bennett, most recently helped manage her son's clinic. A head injury from a car accident when he was in high school changed Dr. Bennett's career path. He was hurt pretty badly, and during that stay in the hospital, he decided he wanted to be a doctor, Miss Bennett said by phone. He was into auto mechanics before that. After earning a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Missouri in Columbia, he received his medical degree from its medical school. And after finishing his residency at Cox Medical Center South in Springfield, 
He worked at St. John's Hospital in nearby Willard, Missouri. In addition to his medical practice, which has been shuttered, Dr. Bennett had a 500-acre farm with beef cattle, and he enjoyed fishing and hunting. Along with his parents and his brother, Dr. Bennett is survived by his son, Austin, his daughter, Shelby Bennett, his sister, Veronica Bennett, and his girlfriend, Haley Hendrickson. Dr. Bennett worked closely with Ms. Kramer, the county official, and suggested to her last year that the town adopt a mask-wearing mandate after several COVID-related nursing home deaths, but the idea did not advance. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today. Really excited for this conversation and let me introduce you to my guest, Gabriel Boslett. Gabriel Boslett is Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine and is the Program Director for the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship. Since the pandemic began, he has cared for COVID patients in the ICU and helped to deploy and educate critical care trainees through the two COVID surges in the state of Indiana. He also runs a COVID Facebook information page for the state of Indiana, known as the Hoosier COVID Update that has become a community of over 40,000 followers. Gabriel Boslett, thank you so much for joining me on COVID Calls today. Yeah, Scott, thanks for having me. <clears throat> and also just to point out um, that it's Memorial Day and you're taking time away from family and from relaxation to, to talk today. So really appreciate that as well. Let me start the way I usually do, just find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is there today. Yeah, so I'm, I'm calling from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I'm in my home office. Um, the pandemic here is at a slow boil. Um, we, since January, cases have plummeted um, along as, as we've been vaccinated more and more. Um, cases have drifted down. We have about eight cases per 100,000 per day currently. Um, and hospitals are back to pretty normal business, um, which is good because the, the months of December and early January were were pretty awful actually. So things here um, are in a, in a good position, um, I have to say. And vaccination rate there in Indiana, do you have a, a sense of that, how it compares to other states? Yeah, you know, I mean, the State Department of Health has done a really good job um, with the rollout. I mean, from the standpoint of logistics, we, we've had one of the most seamless rollouts. Um, we have a statewide um, uh, vaccine registration system that goes to the state department of health. So it's all centralized. Um, you can even, you still register with the individual pharmacies, but all those pharmacy websites are, are linked into this central database. Um, and so it's been really easy to get, um, registered and the process has been really well designed here. Um, we had a rollout that was age-based, so they were very deliberate. They did 80 and above, 75 and above, 70, and down and down and down, much to the chagrin of some people who, who thought some groups were left out that shouldn't be, but it really rolled out pretty smoothly. But we do remain in the lo lower, probably 10, uh, lowest 10 uh, states in the country as far as the percent of people vaccinated. It's not for lack of access. It's not for lack of ease. It's really mostly... Um, that um, we live in a pretty red state and um, we there are a lot of Hoosiers who remain hesitant to get the vaccination. We might come around to this a little bit later in the conversation, but it is um, something that I think a lot of people are wondering about how, how you are going to increase those numbers over time. I, know, I don't know any uh, epidemiologist or public health um, expert I know or doctor who gives up on people. Uh, so, you know, what do you think is possible in terms of changing minds and getting that number up? I think minds will change. I think minds are already changing, frankly. I, you know, I think the, the more experience we get, a lot of people are hesitant because they just say it came along too quickly and, um, we don't have enough data yet. And literally every day that goes by, we get hundreds of thousands of data points on the safety of this thing. And so honestly, a lot of people have already been swayed by, um, how safe the rollout has been. 
to reduce their hesitancy. And I think that's only going to continue. I think, um, I think states will start to share data on the numbers of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I keep, I, I keep hoping that Indiana starts to do that. And I think that we, I think we're going too soon. And I think once people see that their local data on who's in the hospital and who's dying and whether or not they're vaccinated, I think it's going to, I think it's going to turn more. I, I think there is, is a pocket of people who are unconvincible and that's okay. I mean, um, there's nothing I can do to convince those folks, but I think most of the people who are waiting are doing so out of prudential caution. So we have a lot of issues to, to come to today. I like to, whenever I get a chance to st speak with a physician, I, I like to start with this question, which is just to ask you a little bit about your medical training and the extent to which your training prepared you or didn't prepare you for what we've been through in these last 16 months. Yeah. So my training, let's see. So I went to the University of Notre Dame um, for undergrad, and then I went to Ohio State for my medical school and residency training. I did a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics, and then I came to Indiana University um, to do a fellowship in pulmonary critical care medicine. And so I finished that training 11 years ago, um, and so for the last decade plus, I have been in uh, pulmonary and ICU doc, and so my training has basically been for this. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I, I say, and, and I don't love the analogy, but it's sort of true is that this was sort of, this is sort of the Olympics of my specialty, right? Something for which a lot of us have trained for years and decades, uh, that will probably hopefully only get to do once or have to do once. Um, and for which we're willing to sort of work really hard. And so, you know, those of us in critical care medicine, um, know how to do this. Um, we've learned a boatload since the pandemic began because COVID is a pretty unique disease. It's a very odd disease. Um, but my training in intensive care medicine um, made sort of the last year um, almost like a, a, a sprint that I've been training for for a long time. It's interesting to you that you say the training was there. And then in some ways, this is the kind of moment, I'm sure that maybe the medical school, they don't sit down with you and say, hey, we're going to have a once in a century pandemic sometime in your life. Well, maybe they do say that. I don't I don't know. But the psychological preparation to me seems to be an important aspect of it as well. What you're indicating is that that's sort of already in the in the mind of a physician with your with your training as you come into a disease outbreak or, or I don't not think quite. So. So the psychological training, no. I mean, the sort of nuts and bolts, the blocking and tackling of ICU medicine is something that we're ready for. But I can tell you this, you know, March of last year, my psyche was not in a great place um, as this thing was bearing down upon us. And I don't think there's anything that could have prepared me or my colleagues for when we heard the hoofbeats and were preparing for what we knew was going to be something we'd never experienced before. So, you know, while, while we were ready, um, sort of from a medical knowledge skill standpoint, um, I don't think any of us were, would say that we were even close to ready from a psychological standpoint for what this has been like. So in your case, there are other, other factors involved as well. And as you've, as you've shared, and I hope we can talk about now your wife, Sarah, had a cancer diagnosis in January of 2020. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. So my wife um, on January 15th was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she's a physician. She's a pediatrician. Um, and so that was, you know, we knew about SARS-CoV-2 at that point. We at least had an idea that it was in existence. I don't think that, that you know, the pandemic was was, you know, barely a twinkle in anyone's eye at that point in the United States. Um, and so, you know, January for, for Sarah and I were, were basically consisted of, you know, the torture of sorting through the emotions and 
issues around a, a new cancer diagnosis. Um, and then, you know, so she basically started chemotherapy as COVID came and, um, that I, I think back to it and it, I don't know how we, I don't know how I psychologically, I don't know how I emotionally survived all this. Um, you know, that was an amazing time and, um, altered my role in care of COVID patients greatly because I, I, I can remember traumatically, uh, very specifically, we were, I can remember being in, in our bedroom, Sarah and I, and I think I was putting my folded clothes away or something. And I had just got off a phone call with Sarah where I was, um, she was in chemotherapy and I just got on a phone call where one of our fellows was designing, um, uh, sensor system to be able to ventilate two patients with a single ventilator, um, which we've not done before. Um, and I, it was really neat work and I was really proud of this fellow. And so I was telling Sarah, you know, this is going on and here's what we're doing and here's, here's how this is going. And, um, I kind of, there was kind of a lull in the conversation and Sarah looked at me and she's like, you know, you're not going to be able to go to, to do this. Right. And I, I was kind of like, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you're not going to be able to go into the intensive care unit with me on chemotherapy. And I, I, I don't know why I hadn't thought of this before, but it, it, it hadn't occurred to me and it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized, oh my gosh, she's right. Like, um, yeah, I can't bring that virus home. Um, she's immuno, immune compromised on chemo. And sure enough, a few days later, my boss called and said, Hey, you know, we're going to have you not be in the ICU. You're going to do other stuff, education, coordination, scheduling, boring, administrative stuff, boring, administrative stuff. Um, and that, you know, I was extremely grateful to my colleagues. I mean, I, I, you know, my heart kind of swells thinking about that, but also there's a shame. There's a level of shame for me, um, in, um, the fact that people were going into the fray in my stead, um, and that I was missing out, you know, I, I hate to say it this way because it sounds, it sounds a, a little bit fickle, but you know, when I, I refer to this as the Olympics before and man, I wanted to go, you know, like I wanted to run that 400 or whatever it would have been, you know, I was, I just felt up to the challenge. And so, boy, that, that was a real whirlwind of emotions, uh, when that happened. Um, and it sort of led to all the stuff I've done since, I guess. So you gave a interview, um, back last spring. Uh, and in that you said, um, touching on just what you were saying a moment ago, you said, I mean, you've done all this preparation. You just want to go. I feel guilty by the fact that others are putting themselves in harm's way to protect me and Sarah. And that, that's operating at so many different levels too. So there's the care providers who were tending to Sarah's needs. And then also your colleagues who are stepping in because you're having this realization, you're not going to be on the front line, at least for a time. Uh, I think that's, again, coming back to where we started, that's um, for a doctor who's trained to go in to that moment and be on that front line, that's, that puts you in a, you're really balancing a lot of needs of different people in that moment. That's right. I mean, you know, not only that, so, I mean, the, the layers here are just massive. So not only that, but I was a fellowship, I'm a fellowship director, right? So there are 21 you know, learners, what well, they're physicians, but they're, you know, people learning to do critical care medicine who are providing a lot of the bedside frontline care who I'm, you know, at the same time, I'm also like rearranging their schedules to get them into, you know, cause there was a, a clinical need that we had never had before. And so, you know, not only do I have that, the worry about sort of what's going to happen with Sarah, um, is she going to be okay? But also worrying about my colleagues that are in, that are going in on my behalf, but also the fellows that we were sending in as well. These are people who, you know, um, came here to train, to do this. They didn't come here. You know, I, I, I felt very responsible that they not get sick. I was deathly afraid that someone's, that one of my colleagues or, or the trainees was going to get sick and, 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 and die. Um, so the, so that, so there's that anxiety as well, and also just managing my own anxieties, right? So look, normally the way that I would manage that anxiety is go into the ICU and care for patients, right? Like I'm like wired to sort of 
there, there's potential energy there and it needs a kinetic output. And generally the kinetic output is me at the bedside caring for critically ill patients. And I didn't have that. And so, you know, my level of anxiety day to day was massive. And, and, you know, my anxiety manifests itself as early awakenings. Um, and I was up uh, truthfully, I was up at three, three thirty every morning. And I literally, I would come into this space, into this desk and I would sit and pound out whatever I was working on. It's usually a schedule, uh, ventilator triage guidelines, um, uh, education stuff for the next, for the next, uh, conference we were going to have, cause we converted everything to COVID, uh, updates. And so, you know, it was, uh, those, that, those four months between when Sarah started chemo and when she was finally done and I was able to go back into the ICU were the longest decade of my entire life. Her chemo also overlapped the, the real, I mean, it's been brutal in different parts of the countries at different times, but her, her treatment really overlapped some of the really roughest months. And I wonder how, how she was able to navigate the health system at that time. I've had other you know, doctors on who, who talked about the improvisations they had to go through to deal with people um, who had chronic illness or who had cancer as the pandemic was, um, you know, breaking out. How did she make it through that? Part of it is just, you know, necessity, number one, like there, we didn't, we didn't have a choice. Um, it was hard. I mean, her chemo regimen was every three weeks, she would have to go in for a day long infusion. And so when, when we realized what the schedule was, I blocked that day every three weeks to go and just spend with her. So it was a time where both of us were sitting there in the infusion center to sort of just go through this together as much as I could support her by just being there. And we would, I, I can remember we were watching, I think, Tiger King or what was that show with the, the goofy guy on Netflix? Um, and we would watch that or Schitt's Creek or something and just kind of enjoy the day. I would go and get a sandwiches at lunch. And, you know, there was a day where we showed up. It was in mid-March for her Monday morning. And they, they told me, you can't go in. Like we had no warning. I literally was there with my bag of goodies and they were like, you can't go in with her. And so she, I had to watch her walk in to receive this poison for, six hours and not be able to do that with her. So navigating that, the sense of loneliness, you know, I mean, I could talk for an hour about what we've done to people from the standpoint of visitation procedures in hospitals, because I lived it with Sarah, not only through the early pandemic in, in June and July, when I was unable to, uh, to go to her chemotherapy sessions with her, unable to attend her oncology sessions her she had a large surgery uh in the summertime and uh there was a pre-surgical session where they did teaching on how to do all the post care which i was going to do that i was unable to go to because of covid visitation right which was insane and then she had another surgery in january of this year so just what five months ago where she was hospitalized for four days and i could see her for for an hour post-surgery I mean, it was, it is what we, we're going to look back and shake our heads on what we've done. In fact, Sarah and I wrote a piece uh, that we published on Medium about the fact that the, the COVID visitation policies are, 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 are benefiting no one. They don't benefit physicians, nurses, doctor, uh, patients, or family members at all. And I continue to think this. Most hospitals have gotten much better, but yeah. From my perspective, the, being unable to be at the bedside is, aw is awful. From Sarah's perspective, I think that she would say that she barely got by, I think, right? I mean, she, I think that she would look back on it and sort of shake her head on the fact that, that she did as well as she could. I mean, I think we both do. I'm, I'm very proud of her. It's, I, I can't imagine, you know, I know what my lived experience is. Hers was far worse. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. And the, the stresses on the medical system, um, I don't know if that was obvious. I mean, you know what to look for since you're, since you're a practitioner, but cancer patients, um, you know, from what I've read and, and what I know, every, everybody became a COVID specialist who could be. Everybody was dealing with COVID in, in the hospital. Maybe that's not as much 
the case in cancer units, I'm not sure, but could you feel the stress and the, the tension on the doctors, the, the nurses, the staffs that you were dealing with? Yeah. Or were they able to sort of parse that out in the medical centers you were in and there was people working on COVID and there's who weren't? Because I know in big cities and like in New York or in New Jersey, in my colleagues, uh, from neighbors who I asked about this back at that time, March and April, they're like, no, everybody's an internist now. Everybody's an intensivist now. That's just the way it is. Well, yeah. So, I mean, in a very real sense, we, we prepared for that, right? I mean, we had a system set up to where surgeons, ophthalmologists, everyone was going to come into the ICU and help care for patients. And we did deploy some of that. So, so there, that was actually a very real, um, uh, issue early on and then in, in the later surges as well. But in a very real sense, you know, medical care, even outside of COVID units was dramatically changed because um, I think we all realized the benefit of family members in the day-to-day -day of care of a patient, either, either at the bedside in the intensive care unit or in the, in the cancer clinic um, or in the, in the chemotherapy infusion center um, or wherever, I mean, literally everywhere. I mean, COVID did dominate all of medicine because it changed. We, we, in a very draconian sense and needed draconian sense at the time, frankly, limited things so much that it absolutely changed the trajectory of a lot of patients' care simply because um, the, we, we had to operate in a way that we never operated before. And that meant difficulty in, in, accessing family members, literally daily phone calls to update people, which we don't often do because there's often a family member at the bedside. Um, and so in a very, you know, in a, in a very, very real sense, everyone became an internist um, because we were, that's kind of was the backup plan for how we we're going to man our ICUs. But also COVID just fundamentally changed the way we all had to practice because it was you, you and the patient or you and a screen looking at a patient. And we'd never had to do that before. So, uh, Sarah's doing okay now. Yeah, Sarah's doing pretty well now. I mean, she's back to um, she's back to working. Uh, she's um, her hair's growing back. It's to this kind of mid length, kind of wavy uh, what, that I really like actually. That and she never had her hair that short. Um, and she's she says she's at 90% and I would, I would probably agree with that. And I'm, I'm very, very thankful. She's cancer free, which is great. Well, really glad to hear that. And just pause for a second here and just uh, underline how important it is for you to share this story as well uh, for people listening, uh, people who will be looking back at this conversation, um, hard issues to deal with and to, to use it as a way to communicate to people, but also I'm fascinated that the two of you wrote something together and we'll be sure to get a link to that up um, so people can, can find that about this um, issue of visitation, which I feel like maybe, and I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about that. It, because people don't like to think about hospitals, they don't like to think about needing intensive care or they don't have a framework to think about what a pandemic might look look like. I feel like we don't have these kind of conversations. Like, how do patients advocate for visitation rights um, until it's in the moment, and then maybe it's not possible. People don't have the tools. Can you say a little bit more about your your findings there and some of the things you're recommending in that regard? I mean, I don't, I don't really. I mean, look. I mean, if you think about the four players here, right? So. So you have the patient, right? And so Sarah was hospitalized for four days, three of which were in, on complete bed rest. So there was, there was no loved one at the bedside to sort of support her emotionally um, and psychologically. And that's, that's a big deal. The second is the nurse, the bedside nurse, right? So I can tell you that in the hour that I was there after her surgery, when we got her tucked in to her room, I was constantly helping her, adjusting pillows, getting her iPhone plugged in, making sure that uh, she had all this stuff that she needed a half an hour later, helping her turn in the bed, right? And so these are all the things that once I left, the nurse then had to do. A nurse who's already stressed because the hospital is relatively full um, and, and they're stretched relatively thin. So it doesn't benefit the nursing staff. I can tell you as a physician, it doesn't benefit us. 
I am I'm struck by how different an ICU is without be- families at the bedside to advocate for their loved ones and for me to update every day and to see how sick someone is or how much better they're getting and to help us sort of cheer that person on as they get better. It doesn't benefit us. And it certainly, I'm, I was a family member at the time. It didn't benefit me. Um, you know, I, I had duties back here. We have four kids. And so I was back here kind of helping out the kids, but I absolutely would have been there every day when the kids were in school. Um, and, you know, I needed to know that things were going okay. Uh, we, we relate in the piece that she had one night that was terrible with, with pain and everything. And she didn't call me. And um, I made the note that I, you know, I wish she would have, but I'm glad she didn't. Um, because I just, there was nothing that I could have done besides kind of talk to her and I would have worried like crazy. So, so, you know, I don't, I don't know that it benefits any of those four groups to have the visitation policies that we have now in last year, when we started this, we had to do this. Absolutely. I mean, we didn't know what was going on, but at the, in January, when Sarah was hospitalized for this surgery, we knew, we know how the virus spreads and we know what PPE is. And to me, it seems if you have a family, a a patient with COVID and the family member wants to go see them because it very well may be their last days on earth, we ought to give them the PPE and let them go in there, you know, as long as they understand the risk. So, you know, I don't know. I, to me, common sense says that we, we need to sort of learn and adjust it as we've gone along. And it seemed at least in January that hospitals were being very slow to reopen the visitation policies. I think we're still relatively slow. In my opinion, we ought to be back to normal visitation, normal business in hospitals like mine, where the amount of COVID is relatively low. So, I don't know. It it, it gets into these issues too about the the various different mechanisms of 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 healing, and something I've talked about with other uh, guests on COVID calls the the difficulties, for example, for um, cancer patients and cancer survivors to have their communities which um, have to get moved on online, um, you know, those support groups for many people, I think, are real lifelines, particularly to talk about things that they can't talk about with family members, not easy to talk about, or just hard to hard to convey to family members. I don't know if Sarah's experience resonates with that, but I think that's that, again, gets it to this issue of the um, kind of restriction and making people isolated through COVID, as you say, in the early months, yeah, but as as time goes on, how necessary is that? And again, what are the trade-offs when you put people in a, a sort of sense of isolation when what they need most is a community? That's absolutely right. And I think, you know, the, at early on, the risk benefits clearly favored a draconian limita- uh, visitation policy, clearly. But I think as the as the pandemic went on, I think that we we got to the point where the benefit no longer outweighed the risk. Um, and, and this loss of community, the, the, you know, the fact that we sort of ignored the emotion and the meaning channels of, of, of healing, um, I think was a major disservice to a lot of people who went through, um, what, what, what my wife went through during, during the pandemic. You you said something really fat. Well, you said everything has been fascinating. You said something particularly fascinating a second ago about visitation. I had never thought about this. Um, doctors derive something from that as well. I hadn't really oh. thought of it that way. Oh my goodness. Oh, abs- I mean, especially, especially like an ICU physician, right? Because you're dealing oftentimes with patients who can't advocate for themselves. And you're also dealing with family members who sometimes need to be at the bedside to viscerally see what's going on to their loved one, either to, you know, to, to be able to, because look, even when, so, you know, Sarah was in the hospital for four days, wasn't critically ill, wasn't in an intensive care unit. But I missed out on that entire lived experience with her, which was, which was formative, right? I mean, it, it, it wasn't massively formative. It doesn't, doesn't define who she is today, but it certainly helped, you know, to, to, to define who she was in the weeks after um, and, and was an important aspect of her care those four days there. Take a patient, patient then in the intensive care unit who's, you know, critically ill to exclude family members who then have to pick up the pieces afterwards and go and not, and really have to take them from this black box of a hospitalization through whatever healing period they're going to, to get to. Um, if they, if they didn't walk that journey with the patient, it's, I think it's harder for them to understand where, where their, their loved one is now and where they can expect them to be. 
Also, if a loved one is not going to survive and I'm communicating this over the phone, it's really hard to communicate that even verbally over the phone or through an iPhone with FaceTime and a two dimensional screen, how sick their loved one is. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a, from my perspective, communication with family members is always easier when they can come and we can do it with the, at the patient's bedside or with the patient. And frankly, from the standpoint, look, if I, had to, if I had to practice ICU medicine in a hospital that would never have visitors again, I would, I would go find another job. Because to me, that is, my job is more relational than technical. And um, that would be a miserable job that I would never want. How did the visitation restrictions impact your, your children? I don't think it did. You know, my kids are, um, our oldest are my 15 year old twins that are oldest and they go down to kindergarten as the youngest. And, you know, I don't think they would have visited mom in the hospital regardless. They would not have gone for any of the chemotherapy sessions. So it didn't affect them, but it does affect, you know, you know, people in the hospital. I have a lot of people who, you know, I interact with through social media or whatever, who reach out. And, and, you know, when I published that thing about the visitation was like, yeah, you know, I lost my dad um, in, in July and, and no, we didn't get to go see him before he died. You know, we, he went in and three weeks later he was dead and we didn't get to see him. And to me, that is unconscionable. Like to think that we did that to people at this point. Um, I understand why we did, but man, even now, even the short span of time that's passed since last July, not even a year, seems unconscionable. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls. I'm talking today with Dr. Gabriel Boslett about his experience and his family's experience through the pandemic last year and up to now. Gabriel, um, so you can't practice at the bedside in the middle of the pandemic, taking care of your, your family, taking care of your wife, but you weren't on the sidelines. You shifted, you shifted really, I think dramatically into uh, using social media as a, as a health communication tool. And you created a, a Facebook page, the Hoosier COVID update, which uh, right at the top has 40,000 followers. So when did that start? Tell us about the origin of that. And what's it been like to be a social media influencer for good in the last 15 months. So that started in mid-March um, when things were just starting to unfold here. And our State Department of Health would, would release a, a press release every day around noon that would have the number of new cases. And so I would troll for that uh, press release and I put it into a spreadsheet and created a sim very simple graph um, that basically showed, kind of demonstrated the exponential growth that we were experiencing in the state and I started sharing it on my Facebook page. I mean, I, and I'll talk a little bit about why I did this in a second. And it grew pretty quickly. It grew to the point where people started sharing it. People started requesting friendship on Facebook. I didn't want a bunch of random people looking at pictures of my dog and cat and my kids on vacation. So I, I created the Hoosier COVID update page about a month later, thinking maybe a couple hundred people would, would be interested. And it was pretty, you know, I think within a week there were a thousand followers and within a month there were 10,000 and then two months later it was 20,000 and now it's up to like 40. Um, you know, and so I would basically post a graph of the cases um, and a little commentary at first, you know, here's where we're going, here's the things that we're doing, here's what I think needs to be done. I advocated pretty hard for a mask mandate, um, uh, you know, in the late spring, early summer um, as things were going. Um, and it got more and more, um, sophisticated as I was able to get more and more data. So then the Regan Street Institute, which is a collaboration between uh, IU and a, a private uh, place here, started publishing hospitalization data for the state. I started adding that. The state started publishing deaths data. I, I would literally have to go and screen scrape from these graphs on the State Department of Health's website at, the fir at first. And then they, they created a data hub with downloadable spreadsheets, which has been awesome. I mean, the state of Indiana's State Department of Health and the Indiana uh, Management Performance Hub, which does their data hub, is has deserves all the credit in the world for their data transparency with this whole thing. They have shared literally everything. 
And when we've talked on social media about improvements to things, they've done it like lickety split. And so, you know, now I can go download the thing, create it, create the graphs and put it up. So I was, I was posting every day for the first man, like six months of the pandemic. Um, and the reason I did this initially was I talked earlier about all that anxiety that I had and the fact that I had no kinetic output, I couldn't go into the ICU and do it early on in the pandemic. And this became that output. So this was really an anxiety management uh, tool for me as much as anything else and just sort of grew into what it is, what it is now. Did you notice some, we were talking about community a moment ago in the context of, of, um, you know, cancer treatment for your wife. Did you, did you notice, I mean, people who use Facebook maybe have gotten a little bit cynical about it. You know, as you said, you didn't want a, a bunch of randos checking out pictures of your family vacation. So you create this special channel. If you're like me, I've grown a little cynical about the use of Facebook um, in terms of community formation. seems like that's exactly what you accomplished here. Yeah. You know, I mean, before the, before all this happened, I was extremely cynical about Facebook. In fact, I had almost to set, almost shuttered my Facebook page for the most part. I, I'm much more a Twitter person than Facebook. Um, normally the problem for me was that Twitter, what for me was an echo chamber of medical educators and intensive care unit doctors who were all like screaming that this fire was coming and here are the things we needed to do. And there was no one there to educate. But when I went over to, to Facebook, it was like the opposite. It was a lot of people who needed, um, who, who had either no information or bad information about what was going on. And so for all its flaws, it worked really well for this. And actually the, the, the community of the Hoosier COVID update, um, you know, is one of the reasons why I keep it going. I mean, it, it is literally 40,000 of the most wonderful humans in the state of Indiana. It's, if you read the comments um, from the posts, and I'm, on, I'm only posting about once a week now, I'm only posting once a week now, but the comments are all, I mean, it's, it's all people helping others, people asking questions, five people answering that question. There's, there's been very little, um, you know, you worry about trolls coming in and ruining the whole thing. And that, that certainly has not happened. So yeah, I mean, Facebook has a lot of flaws. Don't get me wrong. At the same time, it has actually worked pretty well for this. I don't love the format of the Facebook pages. I actually would much rather do it in a blog format where I can embed photos and pictures and stuff. I can't do that on Facebook, but boy, um, it's, it has uh, allowed a really cool community to arise out of all of this. I'll just make sure people can find this. It's at facebook.com slash Hoosier COVID. And if you're not uh, aware of what Hoosier is, well, you can go look that up. But in Indiana, people, that's well known, but it's H-O-O-S-I-E-R, COVID, all one, all one word. You mentioned this, and I wanted to ask you about this, uh, because the internet has, has been a battlefield during COVID. I guess it always is, but particularly social media has been a battlefield uh, to get to some facts around COVID. Did you feel that you had to spend a lot of time going through comments, making sure there wasn't... Um, disinformation or misinformation in there and trying to have to police that, or you indicated that it kind of took care of itself. You didn't have to do a lot of that. It, I didn't have to do a lot. I mean, so I would, you know, anymore when I post uh, early on, when I would post, when people would comment, if they had a question, I would try to answer it. Often they would, they would just have a comment and I would usually respond with a goofy gif just to kind of keep things light. I think humor is a, a reason as a pretty big, facet of the Hoosier COVID page. And there were a few boy people. I, so I've had to ban two people from the page. You can ban people from Facebook pages. I've banned two people very early. It's been probably over a year ago, both just for abhorrent uh, language, frankly. Um, and, you know, there are people who share um, contrarian views about the pandemic and, and, and about vaccines as of late. And I don't generally, um, I don't, like ban those people or hide those comments. Generally, um, the crowd takes care of it. Um, and I just kind of monitor it from afar to make sure it doesn't get out of hand. And then if it does, um, you know, the thing that I've found is really useful rather than calling someone out in front of everyone else is just messaging that person. So the nice part about the page is you can message them directly so no one else can see it. 
and just saying, hey, look, we're trying to create a place of civil, you know, discourse, discourse here. You know, you're starting to get a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm worried a little bit about the fact that we're starting to name call a little bit. And I'm, I'm also going to I also say I'm also saying the same thing to the other person that you're interacting with. But, Pete, hey, just let's just keep it civil. And honestly, like 99 percent of the time, people are like you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks for thanks for letting me know. And so, you know, just sort of tapping them on the shoulder like that has been all I need to do. And honestly, I don't have to do that very much at all. Like maybe once a month or something. It's ridiculously infrequent. I just want to read the what you have in your um, pinned post there for the Hoosier COVID update. And this is back from, so cast your mind back, if you will, April 17th, 2020. First of all, you note it's not an official government page. You say it's just one guy using publicly available data to help make sense of the trajectory of COVID-19 in the state of Indiana. Also, the weather, because if spring doesn't get here soon, I just can't even. Um, and you identify yourself as a pulmonary and critical care physician. But I was really struck by the what you say here. You say, I know nothing more than anyone else about this whole thing. I'm just muddling through with everyone else. Well, I'm... I mean, it's pretty modest. I mean, you knew a lot and you do know a lot as a, as a communicator, but that gesture, I think particularly in April of last year, there is an honesty to it there, which is uncomfortable, I think, for a lot of people in science generally, and has been a real sticking point throughout the pandemic that so much of the science has been, science as it, as it does, is about conjecture and bringing in new facts and testing and and we've all watched that in real time and some people like myself have been fascinated by that and just super impressed by the way science communicators deal with uncertainty in public and still get a message across that helps save lives and there you are doing that and sort of saying i'm not totally sure about this but i'll give you a post on monday and, and tell you more i don't know if you were thought about it quite that strategically as you were writing that it but it, to me, it feels very honest, but a very powerful mode of communicating as well. Doctors, I guess I should start with this. Most doctors I've talked to don't relish the idea of communicating uncertainty. But there you are doing it. Look, I, you know, yeah, I, it wasn't like I sort of sat there and, and, you know, strategically thought about being humble with those words. But a, a couple things about it. First, um, I mean, science is a humble endeavor, right? I mean, if, if you're if you're if you're practicing the scientific method, you are by definition. I mean, Karl Popper would say that y your statements have to be falsifiable, right? And so, um, so science, in my opinion, is intrinsically a humble endeavor, um, and. I think a lot of people in public, the people in public health who have gotten in trouble during the pandemic with their communication are the people who haven't, number one, been honest, or number two, been humble about their proclamations. And I think part of this is ingrained in me in the fact that being an ICU physician means that I have to communicate to people all the time with layers of uncertainty, um, constantly. Um, you know, I, when I sit down across, across from a family and have to tell them about their loved one's illness and, and what I think is going to happen and try to predict going forward, what things are going to be like, um, there is a massive amount of uncertainty there. So, you know, I have been baked in a crucible of uncertainty in communication for the last decade plus. And, um, to, I think to abandon that during this pandemic, I thought, I think would, would have been, first of all, disingenuous to kind of who I, who I am as, and, and, and how, what I value in communication, I guess. And, um, I think would have just been an abject failure, um, because we didn't know anything in April of 2020. And I'll be honest with you. I don't think we know that much now either. You know, there there's a lot of times where I think that we know now even less than we did before. And let me give you an example. Hmm. About a month ago, the state of Michigan just set itself on fire with COVID. I mean, the state of Michigan, for for reasons that are completely nebulous to me, became a complete hotbed when all the surrounding states were quieting down. 
And so in Indiana, we're, we, we share a northern border with Michigan. And so I was like, things are really good here right now and, and getting better. And, but boy, we have this conflagration to our north and what's going to happen? And nothing happened. Right. I mean, the northern counties of Indiana, they ticked up their their percent positive positivity in some of the cases, but it it didn't spill down into the states. And I, I'll be honest, I have no idea why that why that was the case. This virus does what this virus wants to do. And I think this virus will always be smarter than us, uh, maybe with the exception of the vaccine. And so for me, humility. Has been has has my wife would disagree with this, but humility, try, I try to make humility the North Star of my communication tactics. Um, and and that hasn't steered me wrong, at least that I know of, except when I'm not, except when I fail at doing it, which I do at times. Did you find that, or do you still find that the Facebook page is a place where you also gain information? I mean, you're the authoritative voice. You're the person bringing the data to people. But I wonder to what extent is it also a communication device where you're receiving? Oh, constantly. Yeah, no, no. I, you know, I read a lot about COVID. Um, I, I'm sort of, I'm, 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 I'm marinated it constantly, but I get a lot of um, information from from people who comment on the page. And there are there are three or four people who comment on the page who um, every time they do, or they if they link an article, I go read it because they've been, you know, as much as me, um, thought leaders for the state of Indiana on COVID nineteen. Um, and so, you know, I, I get both information that way, but the, the nice thing about the page as well is I get a real pulse on what questions John and Jane Q citizen are asking because they'll ask, right. You know, what's going on with this? Um, uh, the most recent one is, you know, I have an adolescent who got their first Pfizer and now I'm hearing about the myocarditis. Should I wait? Right. So I get an, a, an idea of what's going on out there sort of in the community as far as what questions people are answering. So yeah, it's a, it's a great source of information for me. I wonder, we were just talking a, a few minutes ago about uh, medical training. Do you think this now becomes something that you have to train residents in or even in, in um, medical training earlier in the, in the process, in the curriculum to talk about use of social media? I mean, I'm sort of thinking of all the things that doctors have had to learn how to do in this last 15 months that go beyond clinical practice, uh, I wonder if that somehow gets actually, you know, written into the curriculum or I worry we might lose that. I mean, what you're describing here in this kind of um, careful way is a really particular and impactful practice of educating and also educating yourself. I don't know. Is that is that now get into the med school curriculum or do we treat this as a one off? No, I don't think we treat this as a one off. Um, I don't think it becomes a large part of the curriculum. But, you know, I, I, I am put it right now putting together a video for our incoming medical students on, um, you know, how to curate your social media presence in a way that um, is uh, helpful and, and reasonable. Right. I mean, so, you know, there are a lot of questions about, you know, not only how to communicate effectively, but also, you know, what are the limits of professionalism within an online space? Um, because if you go to my Twitter feed, it's not all COVID. I post a lot. I post political stuff because I'm a political animal like everyone else. Um, but doing so in a way that, um, you know, doesn't jeopardize, you know, my role as a physician in the community, I think is important. So I do think that there is a you know, a, a need for educating those professionals who are come behind us on um, number one, um, how to be a normal human on social media while also being a professional. But number two, how to communicate with others who don't have your training so that they understand what's going on. There's a whole, you know, uh, discipline of science communication. Um, and I have terrific colleagues here at IU who've been wonderful resources for me uh, on sort of um, in, in sort of getting the word out on, you know, humility, humi humility, truth telling, uh, use of humor, et cetera. So, you know, do I think it's going to be a large part of the of the of the curriculum? No. Um, but I do think people need to be aware. And, and I'll be honest, I don't think that this 
is limited to um, medicine. I think it's sort of all science in general, getting the, the point across to um, the lay public. I mean, if you go on Twitter, a lot of the best people to follow on this are virologists and, uh, and you know, non-physician public health science, science experts. Um, and so all of us have had a crash course in how to do this over the last year. And it's my hope that people will, will learn from that and continue to carry it on. As you were talking, I just sometimes when I have a guest on it and they say a thing and I immediately I think, well, there's 10 dissertations for social scientists who work on the kind of things I do. So this transformation, um, you know, of medical education where you actually have a sit down and have a real conversation with trainees about, as you said, curating their social media presence. Um, that's fascinating and important. And I think that's this, one of these things that it was hit or miss before. But I think you really, you know, in this conversation, you've impressed me that that's that's part of the work. You found your way into it maybe in, in a mode you wouldn't have chosen because you were prevented from being in the ICU. Um, but then you kept doing it. And so that's really a, important. I think we should put a pin in that. I and mean, that's a research question for people to come back and talk to you later and other physicians who may have done the same thing for the first time. I wanted to ask you before, um, once it was safe, you got back in the ICU? Yeah, I did last summer. Um, and I was excited to get back. Frankly, I was like thirsty for patient care, uh, ICU patient care again. And so I've been back in the ICU since about last, um, Jul June or July, I suppose. And, um, it's been interesting, you know, um, December was things, things kind of boiled along through the summer and fall at a manageable clip. And then December happened and things were just a mess. Um, and so, you know, we were well above twice our normal maximum ICU capacity, um, in the hospital where I work. And that's, that's a workload that is, we had to bring in physicians from outside to help with the, with the work. It was crazy. So you, you missed the first surge, but you really, really got the second one. It must've been, um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about kind of a day in in the life of December for you. Yeah. Yeah. So a day in the life of the ICU in December, you know, I probably was on the two weeks that was the most surgy, uh, of the second surge and the second surge at the hospital where I work was worse than the first surge. Um, and so I would come in the hospital around seven, seven thirty in the morning and we would care for about 18 patients, uh, the team and I, and I'd say out of those 18, probably 12 to 15 were COVID patients and they were very sick. Um, you know, caring for COVID patients is um, an exercise in humility and patience for an ICU doctor. I, I, I say it's this disease makes you feel like a bad doctor um, because you literally are just providing really good supportive care plus dexamethasone, which is a steroid, maybe tocilizumab. Um, and the rest of it is just the blocking and tacking, tackling of good ICU care. And you're really relying on the patient's immune system to take care of the infection and then ramp itself down um, and stop being the bad guy. Uh, and so it was a day in the life in December was a lot of, um, I was, I didn't have my beard at that time. So it was a lot of N95 masks. Um, it was a lot of yellow gowns and gloves. It was a lot of family meetings over the phone. It was a lot of people dying, um, of COVID-19, um, and, you know, I, you don't, our batting average was not great. Um, I worked in an ICU that has a lot of cancer and advanced organ failure to begin with. Those patients tend not to do well. Um, and it was just really hard. And one of the hardest parts was not having family members at the bedside again. And, you know, family members desperately wanting to come in and us having to work with the social worker and the, and the administration to, to kind of try to twist arms as much as we could to get people in there to see their loved ones before they died. It was, it was a heart wrenching couple of weeks. 
do you have colleagues there in the ICU who'd been through the first surge and and were able to say, oh, here we go, and here's what we're going to look for in the in the next week or two, or had the personnel changed changed through? I don't really have a good sense of how how much doctors were asked to do both surges. Yeah, no, it's the same group of us. Um, you know, I wasn't clearly on the first one, but you know, my partners were, and we, you know, we have a really cohesive division. So we had we we constantly are talking about. Um, you know, how the ICUs are going and kind of what to expect. And so, yeah, we, there was a good amount of knowledge sharing from the first surge that informed the second surge greatly. Um, you know, we learned a lot of things to do differently. Um, you know, we, we, we went through, a, a lot of us went through a, a, a part of the first surge thinking that these people needed put on a ventilator really early like a lot earlier than we normal would, normally would, right? So someone's on high flow nasal cannula, rather than sort of let them wait it out and fight it themselves, we would go ahead and put them on the ventilator early on. And we realized pretty quickly, I think nationwide, we realized that didn't work out very well. So now we sort of do um, the usual sort of timing of putting people on ventilators. Um, that was one of the sort of lessons that we learned. Um, we learned a lot about um, treatment with blood thinners, um, you know, there's a big vascular component to COVID-19 and we thought that maybe everyone would benefit from everyone putting everybody on blood thinners. And it turned out that that wasn't the case. Um, I think only certain populations that essentially got blood clots would really benefit from, uh, blood thinners. Um, and so all of that was, you know, we have, we have conferences regularly in my division. And so the, you know, now that, now that I'm kind of talking about it out loud, I haven't really thought about our process, but we, we, have, we do a really good job of, of sharing information. So I felt really well prepared um, as that second surge came. And you're back to training now too. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, you mean training, you mean? The residents and. and oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. We never stopped. You know, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the fellows, um, you know, the fellows that we're getting ready to graduate our fellows this Friday, actually. Um, and this group of fellows, it's a three-year fellowship. They were baptized in fire, uh, for Absolutely. Sure, and are probably some of the most, um, capable ICU physicians, um, that we've trained because of what's happened with the pandemic. Well, congratulations to them. And it's, it's always the historian in me. It's like, I hope everyone has been keeping a journal through this. Uh, we need to know everything that you've been talking, even just that you know, the dynamics you were describing of how the, how the care team was working through the first surge and then to, to think about how the team was working together in the second surge and how that knowledge builds up and carries over. Really important, I think, to, to understand that. Mm -hmm. So just reminding folks, you're listening to COVID Calls. I'm talking to Gabriel Boslett today about a number of topics. We've just been talking um, about the um, Facebook page that he's been curating throughout the pandemic, uh, Hoosier COVID on Facebook, and, and you, can, you can check that out. Uh, one more thing I wanted to get to, Gabriel, is um, about some, you've also been doing research in this time. I don't know how you find, I, I, as I talk to you more, I do, I see that office space you're in, and I do, I can picture you now there four o'clock in the morning and you're, you're working things out. And, and one of the things you've been doing is um, also some research on infection rates in, in the schools there. And, and you have a paper out with a group of colleagues in the journal Clinical Infectious Disease excuse me, clinical infectious diseases. The title is The Effect of In-Person Primary and Secondary School Instruction on County-Level SARS-CoV-2 Spread in Indiana. I wonder if you could just give us a kind of a first pass on why you thought the study was important and, and what you found. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, I... This came about from social media, frankly. So I, I interact uh, relatively regularly with a guy named Micah Pollock, who's an economist at IU Northwest, um, who has a terrific Twitter feed, frankly, um, and does really great data uh, analysis and visualizations for the state of Indiana. And Mike and I have, have frankly become friends through this whole thing through Twitter. I've met him in person once. Um, but as this was happening and, and we started to reopen schools, we realized that you know, the way that Indiana was opening schools was very decentralized. It was at the level of the cor school corporation. There were 399 school corporations in the state um, and the state had a mask mandate, had uh, uniform um, gathering requirements as schools were opening, but schools could open however they wanted. And so we said, well, we should kind of study this to kind of see if we can 
we already had the outcome measure that were met with that were that were gathering. I mean, we had the daily SARS-CoV-2 rates in the state of Indiana. So why don't if we can we, if we can find an exposure variable, meaning the specific exposure variable that we looked at was um, the percentage of students who went back in person in the county. And so we were able to get county level um, rates of uh, SARS-CoV-2 through the state uh, uh, data hub. And we uh, were trying to figure out, okay, how can we find out in each school corporation what percent of kids are going back in person? Well, Mike knew the dean of the School of Education at IU Northwest, Mark Sperling, and he called up Mark was like, Mark, we're kind of looking for this data. And he's like, Mark's like, well, I can help with this data. Mark used to be uh, uh, heavy in the Department of Education. So he has a lot of context and he's just started reaching out to people. And so we, we got data for like 70 something percent of the counties in the state the percent of kids who were going back in those in the, in each of those school corporations. And we, so we just looked at the percent of students that were going back in person. And then 28 days later, uh, that predictor, uh, how that predicted the SARS-CoV-2 cases. And what we found was that there was an increase in cases with in-person schooling, but that increase was pretty darn low. It, um, for every 10% increase in, uh, in-person learning, there was a 0.336 per 100,000 residents increase in uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, cases a month later. It, and if you look over the course of our study, it wound up being like less, it, like 0.87% or something, I'd have to look it up, of the actual cases that accumulated in that month appeared to be associated with in-person school. So while it was statistically significant, the effect was actually uh, lower than we had expected. So what are the implications of that? I'm, I'm, I like that you, I like the way you talked about getting the data. First of all, I like the scale too. And important to note, as you're saying, the local context of Indiana in which 399 local school corporations are making decisions about when to return and under what circumstances. So that's, that's really, I think, resonant with how a lot of these school decisions have been made across across the country. Well, what do you think are some of the implications of, of the study in that regard? I think it depends on what your priors are, frankly. I mean, so, you know, people took this study and ran with it saying, look, uh, you know, school does increase cases. Um, and then people took the, put, took the study and said, look, school barely increases cases. And so it depends. I mean, remember, school is a risk benefit calculation, right? Um, the risk is spread of the, of the disease in the community. And that's why we chose that as in our outcome measure, because you know, because this virus is so unique and doesn't affect kids that much, measuring outbreaks within schools didn't seem like the, the, the variable that we were all that interested in. What we wanted to know was how much did it spread in the community to the people who are going to have bad outcomes. So, so you know, it, de it depends on what your priors are, right? So if you're, if you're someone who's very risk averse, then you could take this and say, yeah, look, it does increase it. We shouldn't increase it at all. But but I don't think a lot of people do it that way. So I have four kids. And so I'll give you my opinion on, on what it means, right? I have four kids um, that did some sort of combination of in-person, hybrid, and, uh, and virtual school over the course of the past year. They just finished their school year. And had I known at the beginning of, uh, at, in August when my kids were about to go back, that the uh, that having that every ten percent increase in school kids in school increased SARS-CoV-2 cases only zero point three three six cases per one hundred thousand residents, which is what we found. I would have said send the kids to school. To me, the benefits of school far outweighs the relative small increase in um, SARS-CoV subsequent SARS-CoV-2 cases because the benefits of school are massive, right? Um, and so that risk to me seems worth it. Now, look, that's a, that's a values that's a values decision, right? That's my that's me putting my values on on sort of what I think the policy should be. So, you know, we didn't come to a conclusion in the paper of look, schools should be open or schools shouldn't, because that's not it's not the role of that paper. It's just to sort of outlay what the risks are. But to me, the benefits of in person school um, seem to to favor opening of schools. Were you able to take into account variables of whether or not um, kids were required to wear masks in the school, distance, uh, number of seats in the classroom, um, return to school, meaning Monday through Friday versus Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or one week on, one week off? 
Yeah, I, I wonder, could too. you control for those things? Yeah, we, we, so, so we didn't control for masks because there was a statewide mask mandate that, that kids in school. So, so we, what we didn't control for, uh, you know, um, execution, right. That's not the right word, but we didn't control for, you know, how well it was, in, um, it was actually adhered to within the schools mm -hmm. because that would have been a massive undertaking. Um, but we did, we, and we also, uh, the second part of your question was if we controlled for, I forget. A frequency of, of return, whether or not they were there. The that's it. We did not actually. And that's, you know, that's it's one of the things I kind of wish we would have, because we, you know, if you went to school in person at all, you were counted as going to school in person. But a lot of those kids did go school in a hybrid fashion, meaning like one cohort Monday, Tuesday, one cohort Thursday, Friday, and they kind of were able to distance mm -hmm. that way. So mm -hmm. we didn't get that granular only because the the workload we thought was going to be too much. And we were we were trying to do what was feasible uh, and not let perfect be the enemy of the good. Well, I think it's, I mean, again, this study we're going to need, and probably they're happening right now across the entire United States and, and around the world, because just as you said, I mean, the implications of students not being in the classroom has been enormous. We don't often have good metrics to capture some of that, and it's not a lost year. And I know coming from a family of teachers that people, teachers have worked their tails off to try to bring that experience to students, but there's so many things that are lost uh, there. And so mental well-being for teachers and for students is part of this pandemic as well. Agreed fully, 100%. So we're just about out of time. Uh, Gabriel, I need to let you get to uh, whatever grilling responsibilities uh, you have there with family. Just want to remind everyone that you've been listening to COVID calls. And you can catch COVID calls almost every weekday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And I hope you'll join me tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Gabriel Boslett, um, be following up with you, following you on Twitter, following you now on, on Facebook, um, and keeping an eye out for that memoir that I hope you'll write. And that uh, Maybe you hope you're not getting up at 3.30 in the morning anymore, but maybe if you're up at 5, you catch 15 minutes every day to do a little writing, because the story you've told us today is an important one and, and super riveting, and I hope your, your wife health continues the way it is and just best wishes to you and thanks for your time today scott thank you so much and thank you for what you're doing with this this is an that you you mentioned earlier that you hope people are keeping a journal this is a wonderful journal um and is a an a, a herculean amount of work and you are to be absolutely commended for keeping what will undoubtedly be a historic record with with COVID calls Thanks for that, Gabriel. I have a big team helping me out, including my family as well. So thank you for that. And stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow at 530.